With the recent news about Snapchat's share price crash, everyone has started to wonder just how is Apple's new privacy system affecting the companies in the tech industry that are heavily reliant on acquiring user data? Specifically, how is Apple's iOS 14.5 update hurting those companies? And perhaps more importantly, is Apple's claim about them hurting the social media giants to help you, the users, actually a valid claim? Do they actually care about your privacy? And are they helping you? Because in their marketing, they very clearly stated that they want to empower users to take back control of their data. So is Apple living up to those expectations? Well, some people disagree. A lot of them are saying that Apple did this primarily to boost its own ad revenue. And with search ads, Apple's in-house ad service projected to make $5 billion this year, people are wondering, did Apple leave a back door and is allowing themselves to access user data while blocking everyone else? Like, whose nefarious purposes are worse? Apple's or social media giants? But in actuality, the situation is a lot more complicated than that. In this video, I'm gonna try to simplify it in a way that hopefully is understandable. Upfront conclusion, Apple probably doesn't care about your privacy. More likely than not, the whole privacy thing is one, to make themselves look good to people so that way they can invite more users into the Apple ecosystem. But two, is also probably rooted in policy changes and shifts that we're seeing in the tech industry of governmental agencies becoming more and more concerned with what tech giants are able to do with data. And so Apple's kind of like preempting that to keep themselves apart. So that way later in the future, if they're ever questioned in court, they can be like, we specifically tried not to be like Facebook and not let Facebook get any worse. Additionally, by making sure that a lot of user data is stored locally and Apple itself is not able to access user data, they become more friendly to all markets around the world. And it makes them way less likely to get banned out of certain countries the way Huawei got banned in the United States. But that actually means that their privacy system, while is clearly put out there intentionally without really any concern for the user, is probably still a good thing for the user. And the reason I say that it was not put out because they're concerned about privacy is because you always had the option to ask apps not to track you. You still have the option to stop search ads from tracking you by going into the Apple menu settings and turning off personalized advertisements. They just didn't put it on the front page because no one was really concerned about it. Specifically, the feature I'm talking about that's new is that notification that pops up when you open a new app for the first time that gives you the option to ask the app not to track you across other apps. And you may be wondering, okay, they're asking, we're asking apps not to track, but Google has like 50 ways of identifying it's you without actually, without you ever like signing into your Google account. So how could Apple's privacy system actually hurt these companies? Well, I don't think it's gonna hurt Google and Facebook as much as it's hurt Snapchat. Snapchat was just uniquely in a position where Apple's privacy updates really, really hit them hard. And that's primarily because users of Snapchat don't really produce any original content of their own. They're kind of creating stories that they then allow like their friend circle to see, but they're not consuming like public content like you would say on a platform like YouTube or on Facebook where a bunch of posts and videos are constantly being shared about. So they don't have another way of collecting data on you. Let me just give you a brief example of what the difference would be between Snapchat, Facebook, Google, and also search ads. To include search ads in this example, let's say that I'm an app developer because other than app developers and app sellers, no one else can really use search ads to advertise anything because there's no point. Search ads only advertises to people in the app store. So say in this hypothetical scenario, I'm an app developer for a, I don't know, a germ detecting app. You take a picture of something on your phone and it tells you just how dirty that thing is. Snapchat, by tracking users across multiple apps, like let's say Amazon, where Target is able to identify users who are buying like disinfectant wipes or like mops and stuff. And so it can generally understand that those users are probably people who are looking to like have a cleaner living space. And so then it can advertise my app to them. I pay Snapchat for that because it's hitting the people that are more likely than not to download my app. Google and Facebook can do the exact same thing by seeing like what kind of content you engage with the most on Facebook. Is it like how five ways to clean your house better videos or is it something else? And then they can show you an advertisement for my app accordingly, perhaps even in those videos. YouTube's kind of the same way. Google can go through your search history. But Snapchat, as I said earlier, was heavily reliant on seeing what you were doing outside of the app. 
So with Apple's privacy update, once Snapchat was no longer able to see what you're doing outside of Snap, and Snap essentially became its own isolated social media app, without access to knowing what you're shopping or what you're doing on places that are not Snapchat or platforms that are not owned by Snapchat, they have no way of figuring out what kind of advertisements you'd be interested in. And advertisers know this, so why would you then pay Snapchat? Like, if I'm the app developer of that germaphobe app, why would I pay Snapchat to advertise it when Snapchat doesn't even know who to advertise it to? And that's probably why in Snapchat's earning report, they didn't earn as much as was expected, and their share price crashed as a consequence of it. Therefore, those companies are probably not going to take as much of a hit from Apple's privacy system. But of course, we'll have to see the earnings report to actually decide whether or not there was any substantial difference before and after this privacy update. So was this update really meant to protect your privacy? Probably not, because the two main companies that are responsible for invading and collecting user data are still not being stopped by this privacy update. And so the main reasons that I can see for Apple doing this are to build more trust with their consumers and to avoid future problems with the law. Additionally, Apple is probably using user data to make money as well, especially because right now they've slowly been transitioning from a products-based company to a services-based company. And if you want proof of that, you can just look at the past year's worth of Apple events. All of those devices, with the exception of the AirPods Maxes, everything else, when it came out, was the best value device on the market. Based on the way Apple usually does things, <clears throat> I mean the way they sold the iPhone 10 for $1,000, and then had the audacity to release an iPhone 11 that had a worse screen than the 10 and still overpriced it, I would have expected that everything that came out last year, because that was actually like industry leading technology, to have jumped up in price by like five, $600. They literally charged $1,000 for the iPhone 10 for eliminating the fingerprint sensor and throwing a notch at the top, okay? That's who Apple was. But over the past year, we've seen them release good value device after good value device after good value device. Only the AirPod Maxes were overpriced, under specced, and sold completely on Apple hype. The way that Apple devices are usually sold, the M1 MacBooks, those were good value devices. Still, if someone asks for a laptop that's in the $1,000 price range, and they just generally want for it to work and be good for productivity as well as some creative pursuits, you'd still recommend them the M1 MacBook Air. If someone asks for the best value smartphone on the market right now, I'd recommend them to get an iPhone 12, just because there isn't really anything comparable at that like price point. Apple has been unleashing good value products for the past year, even that iPhone SE refresh. What the heck is up with that? Like this is so unlike anything Apple has ever done. And the only justification for it is Apple is switching from being a company that makes all of its money by convincing its users to upgrade to devices that they don't need, to instead providing services like Apple TV+, Apple Fitness, Apple Music, Apple Arcade, which is still a joke, but it exists, and trying to bring users into those platforms or services that they're using so that they can make some money from the devices after they've already been sold purely inside the ecosystem. Whereas before, you paid an Apple premium but you never have to pay subscription fees for anything that Apple provided. And any tech company that is charging you for a subscription service can make money off of user data. Take Netflix, for example. You pay a subscription to them, but they still use your user data, not just to curate a list of stuff that you could see on Netflix and therefore keep you addicted to Netflix because, you know, if you weren't addicted to Netflix, you wouldn't keep paying for the subscription, but they also sell that data to third parties. An easy way to think about this is, how does the internet know that you've watched Squid Game if after watching Squid Game, you literally never looked up any Squid Game related news? It's because Netflix told the internet that you watch Squid Game on Netflix. So even though you're paying a subscription fee to Netflix, they can still monetize your user data. Apple, since they're now selling services, can do the exact same thing. They always could monetize your user data, but when the user data was stored with them, they also had nothing internally that they could do with it to essentially like how, leave you too concerned about it. But now they can't. Now, I know there are some counter arguments to this where people are like, Apple doesn't collect individual user data. They don't need to. They can still monetize user data without tracking you individually. Take this for example. Let's say Apple is looking at Apple Pay purchases for like everyone in the city of Las Vegas. And they see that a lot of people are using Apple Pay to buy pizza 
but not a lot of them are buying pizza from Domino's. Then Domino's could sponsor an Apple TV Plus original like Ted Lasso, and Domino's Pizza could be appearing in there. That would be a fully integrated advertisement, and Apple, despite not tracking you individually, and instead just keeping general track of all of the purchases going on in the city, is able to use that data that they're getting from their users to figure out which sponsors they want to bring on for their Apple TV Plus original, and then charge them more because those are specific sponsors that have something to gain out of it, and they aren't just gambling. Without that user data, Domino's might still sponsor an Apple TV Plus original, and Apple would just have to deal with whatever Domino's was willing to like sponsor them with. Maybe that's free pizza. But with that data in hand, Apple knows that Domino's actually has to pay them if they want more customers, especially customers who are using iPhones. Then they can charge Domino's higher. And everything that they would have got if Domino's didn't have that data, and everything that they got out of Domino's after they presented that data, is all money that they've essentially gained from user data, from tracking a giant population. So no, your data is not useless to Apple. Apple isn't tracking you individually, sure, but they can still make money off of the data that they're getting from you using their devices. All right, that's everything I had to say for this video. I don't usually make videos like this, so if you liked it, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe down below. Additionally, let me know what you liked about it or any other topics you'd like to see me talk about. For now though, my name is Xian, and as always, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.